very much, Lauren. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the latest in the Innovation Network webinar series. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, I'm thrilled to be joined uh, today by Dr. Aurelie Jean, who uh, is going to talk to us about some of her work, uh, in particular, uh, the question, how can algorithms fight against COVID-19? Uh, Aurelie uh, is really a fantastically accomplished and impressive uh, researcher and computational scientist uh, who uh, has worked at, at MIT, uh, is an entrepreneur in her own right, founder and CEO of In Silico uh, Veritas. Uh, she's worked as an advisor in a variety of capacities and has been recognized uh, by the, at the national level by the government of France for her uh, contributions uh, in this field and to, uh, and to education. Uh, she also serves on a number of boards, uh, has a new startup uh, that is going to be going public uh, quite uh, soon, I believe, uh, and many other ways that she uh, brings her uh, incredible knowledge and ability thinking about uh, computational science and how it's actually uh, applied and useful uh, in the real world, particularly in medical and biological sciences, but also more broadly uh, as well. She's also... Uh, uh, teaches in one of our new online uh, courses, which is running right now in future sessions in March and June, Algorithmic Business Thinking, Hacking Code to Create Value. So uh, one of uh, Aurelie's real passions is how all of us need to understand uh, how uh, computation and algorithms and algorithmic thinking uh, actually work well enough to make sure that we're using them uh, or they're being used wisely in our, in our organizations and that we can make the most of these tools uh, in our own uh, professional and even home lives as well. So Arlie uh, will today be covering uh, out of this huge array of things that she could uh, talk about, uh, this specific question of algorithms uh, and how we can use them in the battle against COVID-19, including, as you can see on the slides, uh, how to use them in, in uh, estimating uh, how the pandemic evolves, how we detect the virus, predict predicting outcomes, and importantly, insisting in developing new vaccines and how do we think about prioritizing vaccine distribution, which is very much front of mind for all of us at the moment. Uh, so with that, I would like to uh, hand over to Ali. We'll spend about uh, 15 or 20 minutes uh, sharing her ideas and her work with us. And we'll have some Q&A at the end where I'll come back and help with that. So Ali, over to you. Thank you, Peter. Thanks a lot. So um, I would like really to thank you, Peter, and, and the entire team, Lauren Markin, Meg Regan, and, and the entire team for organizing this session. Really, thank you. Um, so today, as Peter uh, mentioned, I'm going to talk about how can algorithms fight against COVID-19. So here I use the word algorithm and not artificial intelligence. So it's I do that on purpose because we use the word a lot, artificial intelligence, but I prefer the word algorithm or any other words to express exactly what we mean here. And algorithms are literally um, a sequence of hierarchical steps to be executed by a computer when it's computer uh, algorithms uh, that are actually made to solve a problem, uh, answer our questions. And the algorithm are actually part of the artificial intelligence that is uh, literally computer simulations in a way, you know. So um, for us to start, um, I wanted to talk about what I experienced, and I'm sure you experienced the same, which is we've been experiencing, experiencing since the beginning of this crisis and scientific and leadership revolution. So a scientific leadership revolution in terms of how we work, how we collaborate, how we develop, how we think, how we conceive, how we test and how we back test. So here, obviously, in terms of science, we have been developing and implemented, um, develop, implementing solutions in such a way that we've never done before. So we uh, experience an acceleration. Also, we collaborate um, with of a broad range of disciplines with many different kinds of people, you know, like um, economists, sociologists, um, scientists, medical doctors, physicians, et cetera, et cetera. So it's totally unique. There is also a large scale of worldwide aggregation of knowledge and data to tackle many problems related to the crisis and the COVID-19, we'll see how and, and which kind of problems. And of course, we've, experiencing, we've been experiencing a unique state governance and unique healthcare governance as well. So here, I wanted to focus on two things. First of all, the fact that from a science perspective and from a leadership perspective, we have been experiencing a new 
kind of collaboration. We have been collaborating in such a way that we could accelerate and work together in a different manner to find solution in very tricky uh, problems. Another thing is, I always say that this crisis, you know, that we've been experiencing for a year now, is actually a unique use case for leaders to understand why algorithm can do in general for many in many applications. And why? Because as you're going to see in this presentation, to tackle, to fight against COVID-19, artificial intelligence algorithms have been used in such a way to tackle different kinds of problems in different contexts, you know. And uh, as I always say, I mean, this during this crisis, leaders have accelerated their digital transformation because we had no choice. Well, it's uh, also a good time to accelerate the algorithmic transformation by using algorithm to improve the way we work, also to better understand our market, understand our clients, et cetera, et cetera. So first, before telling you what, how algorithm can fight against COVID-19, let's go back to what algorithm can do in practice. Well, they can do many things. Though, as, in, as I said, you know, initially, so um, thanks to algorithm, we can answer specific questions. We can solve specific problems. We can also anticipate and predict a phenomenon in the given context. And we can also, and which is not, uh, say usually, but this is very important, especially in research, we can understand the underlying mechanism of a phenomenon in a given context. So not only we predict, we can also understand, which is a big deal, especially in this crisis, for instance. So that being said, you can tell me, okay, so if algorithm can predict, anticipate, answer specific questions, solve specific problems, how the algorithm were not capable of predicting the starting point of the pandemic, well, there is a reason for that. And to understand that, we need to go a deep further into algorithm explanation. So I like to distinguish two set of algorithm, the explicit algorithm versus implicit algorithm. So let me explain you. So explicit algorithm, which is in the top here, it's actually algorithm that are explicitly defined by human being as scientists, engineers, conceptors you know, of this algorithm, again, to solve a problem, um, to answer a question, for instance. So when I say we define explicitly the algorithm, we define the criteria, we define the assumptions, we define some mathematical expression, et cetera, et cetera, some conditions, and we then implement that algorithm into a piece of code, a program, uh, a software program, you know, then to be executed on um, a computer to get the output data here. Well, there is also the implicit algorithm. We also um, talk about machine learning. I'm sure you've heard about that word. So here, the difference is that there are still human in the loop, don't get me wrong. But here, what we do is that we use a generic algorithm that we train over a set of data to actually define implicitly by training the criteria, the, um, the conditions implicitly, the logic behind the algorithm to then uh, be executed on a computer and to get the output data. Usually, you know, we also talk about hybrid uh, algorithms. So there is an explicit part and an implicit part in this algorithm. So why did I make this um, difference? It's because in the case of the COVID-19, we're not capable of predicting the beginning of the pandemic for two reasons. First of all, in terms of this explicit algorithm, we didn't know anything about the mechanisms behind that virus. We didn't know how that virus was living. We didn't know how, like within organism, we didn't know also how that virus was able to transmit from one person to another. So we didn't know a lot compared to now. And also in terms of implicit algorithm, we could not really train any algorithm over a set of data because this crisis, this virus, you know, is totally unique. We didn't have any similar event in the past on which to train an algorithm. Just for you to know the seasonal flu, uh, algorithm are trained over the set of data to actually predict, you know, the evolution in times and space of the seasonal flu every year. So we couldn't do that obviously for the COVID-19. That being said, algorithm can do many things, and especially now because we have more knowledge, more data. So how can algorithm help against the pandemic? We're gonna see different things today. And obviously I cannot go into details, but I try to put the references, you know, the title of paper, so you can actually go back and find those paper uh, for free, usually uh, on different platforms. So they can do many things. Anticipate space and time evolution of the virus. We'll see how, understand, and treat the virus, accelerate the development of vaccines. This is something that we tend to forget, but we've been pretty fast in developing those vaccines. Why? Because actually, actually um, algorithm 
came to see, came to the place to um, to actually simulate uh, some different molecules for the vaccine. Also, to enhance virus diagnosis capability and accuracy, we'll see how design and support the logistic of healthcare delivery, but also the logistic of vaccine delivery and administration. So I'm going to show a few examples for those cases. First, anticipate time and space evolution of the virus. So here, um, different kind of models. For the first two papers, it's um, they are talking about explicit algorithm, the one that we explicitly define. So in the first paper, for instance, here, forecasting the long-term trend of COVID-19, here what they do, they actually use a model that has been used, by the way, for the Spanish flu, which is the compartmental SIR model, SIR for susceptible infectious recovered. What we do here is that we develop three mathematical expressions with an exponential evolution with time to express the number of people susceptible to the virus infected and under recovery, you know, as a function of time to actually predict the evolution. So the challenge of this model is that we need data to calibrate the, the parameters of each mathematical expressions. So obviously we need data, so we need to be um, to, to, to be in the process again uh, of seeing people recovering to be able to um, calibrate this model. Uh, other kind of models, algorithm, machine learning models, so the implicit algorithm. Here, what they do is that the um, scientists actually develop algorithm trained over a set of data uh, of patients to actually forecast the evolution of the COVID-19. The set of data that, has that was used as a training data contain metadata, so what describe the data point of patient with, uh, for instance, um, some uh, obviously demographic data like um, age, sex, but also uh, some uh, clinical data, whether this person has asthma or diabetes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they were capable actually of forecasting the evolution of the COVID-19, but obviously here we couldn't do that at the beginning because we needed some data. So we had to wait, you know, for um, uh, a few months to get the data and to be able to train algorithm to forecast the evolution in time and in space also. Another um, application is enhanced virus diagnosis. So I love this example because those examples because we've seen those a lot in the press. So first on the top right, the, the triage. So this technique is actually what we call um, a clustering algorithm. So it's an implicit algorithm that is trained over a set of data to actually do a triage of patients coming to ER to distinguish the patient that need more care or that are more fragile um, to um, or in critical uh, situation to be take, taken off. So here, what they've done is that they train uh, the algorithm over a set of data that contains obviously again demographical data such as the age and the sex, but also some clinical data based on testing, PCR testing results as well as gas and gas um, blood and blood gas testing. Then another example is AlloCovid. So AlloCovid is actually it was developed by the INSERM uh, among others in France. So for you to know, the INSERM is the equivalent of NIH, I would say, in the United States, the National Institute of Health. So here it's a chat or a call bot. So in practice, you're a patient, you call this chat bot or call bot and you answer a few questions. And based on your answers, the bot is capable of saying, based on an algorithm that was trained over uh, many conversations, was able to define whether more like, you know, if you, if you have the COVID. Obviously this application works worked very well over summer because there was no seasonal flu at that time. When there is a signal flu, it's more challenging because the symptoms, you know, uh, overlap the ones from COVID. So it's not as efficient, obviously. And the last example that I love that was developed by um, uh, MIT researchers is actually an algorithm that was trained over a set of forced cough recordings of people having COVID or didn't have COVID. So the idea here, here was to develop an algorithm that was capable of saying whether an, um, someone asymptomatic at the COVID or not, based on the type of coughing, you know. So it was um, this one actually was uh, very interesting and 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 um, and was uh, that uh, had a lot of press coverage. Another one is to understand treat the virus and conceive a vaccine. So I'm going to talk about the conception of the vaccine here. So um, as you know, uh, elaborating a vaccine takes time. So it's not my field of expertise, obviously. So I had to look at how we build a vaccine. So it seems that 
for you to know, the virus actually comes to a cell by actually by being on a protein that comes to the cell. So that makes sense when you build a vaccine, when you conceive a vaccine, what you have to do is you need to uh, find a molecule that can bind this with this, uh, with this uh, protein. So to do so, uh, scientists, researchers are actually do a lot of testing on many, many types of molecules to find the one that can fit the uh, expectation and the requirement for this virus. That being said, it takes time. You know, it's it's a lot of time, a lot of work, a lot of testing. And uh, actually for many years already, um, scientists have been using um, some simulations, computer simulations and algorithm to virtually test molecules to find the right one. And, or at least to find a set of molecules on which they can then do the uh, actual real testing. So they narrow um, the, the list of molecules to try and to test. So here, this is what actually happened. Uh, scientists use um, algorithm to accelerate the development of a vaccine. And this is something that we, we should say more because people always are, are very, um, um, you know, they're, they're surprised to see how fast it was, you know, and actually because algorithm help uh, doctors and, and scientists conceive that vaccine. The last example, which is to me very interesting because this is what actually we're experiencing now, it's the, um, the logistic, the logistic of healthcare delivery and vaccination. So you may know that, but um, in supply chain management, we've been using algorithm for a few years now. What we do here is, for instance, we can do some linear regression on data on the current supply chain to be able to optimize future supply chain based on the demand, but also based on the capability. And we can optimize the time, also the space of the, of the capabilities of supply chain. So it's very interesting because those algorithms have been used also as well for supply chain management for healthcare delivery to um, to deliver the vaccine, to deliver the product, to deliver any ca any resources that we need in a hospital, for instance, also any um, any management, any logistic within the hospital itself. And I always talk about the um, the hospital of Montreal, uh, which has been to me uh, uh, um, a key actor in in using those algorithms to support the logistic of the hospitals. You know, and uh, another example that I like to talk. It's which is the one that is very, I would say, sensitive today. It's the vaccination uh, administration. So how we actually prioritize the people to get the vaccine? Because as um, as we know, I mean, we um, there are a lot of people to get um, to get vaccinated, and obviously uh, we don't have we don't produce as many as vaccines as we we could. So we have to do that. Uh, we have to prioritize the number of people to get vaccinated, and also the 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 nurses, the doctors to deliver. Uh, to administrate the vaccine, you know, we have to prioritize those people as well to make sure that we actually get the ideal vaccination strategy of a country, for instance, but also to make sure that we minimize the waste, because you may know that, but when we uh, vaccine, when we vaccinate people, you know, we tend to have some waste of vaccine just because for um, time issues or for et cetera, et cetera. And with the, with the vaccine, again, uh, against the COVID-19, the, um, the, there are more requirements in terms of temperature, in terms of how long you can keep the vaccine out of cold, et cetera, et cetera. So all those things need to be considered, you know, obviously when you want to prioritize a list of people to get vaccinated because you want to minimize the waste uh, of those vaccines. You may have heard about that um, study, so an article from uh, an hospital in Stanford. So they actually built an algorithm that was really uh, simple. It was just a list of explicit rules, depending on your age, for instance, to actually prioritize the people to get the vaccine. And it seems that this algorithm was not working well because there were actually more vaccines than people over there to get the vaccine. So it's bad when you want to minimize the waste, of course. So I don't blame them, don't get me wrong, because those algorithms, when you have to develop them quickly, you know, it's sometimes you miss something or you make mistake, which is obviously uh, normal. But here it's interesting because it shows something very important that we saw before, like a few years ago on, on vaccine delivery administration is the fact that sometime when we build algorithm, when we conceive them, when we train them or calibrate them, we tend also to introduce what we call algorithm bias. So I haven't talked much here about it, but 
those biases are very much important because they can actually impact negatively the output of the algorithm. Just for you to understand, there was a few years ago, there was an algorithm working on vaccine uh, delivery. And this vaccine, this algorithm was actually um, impacting negatively people of color. Why? Because one of the criteria of the uh, algorithm was actually the, the cost of healthcare per individual. And it, it was in the United States. And, and we've seen statistically that people of color, you know, from poor area have more cost of healthcare just because they tend to wait before going to the doctor. And because of that, they were discriminated, you know, in a way uh, by this algorithm that was prioritizing uh, the people for this vaccine. It was not for COVID-19, it was for something else. But just for you to know that we have to be very careful when we build this algorithm to make sure that they are inclusive, that there is no biases and no bias and no discrimination eventually. To finish, uh, I just want to show you two books that I love. Uh, they are from the MIT Press Essential Knowledge Series. Uh, they are a very small book and, and made for everyone. You know, you don't have to be a scientist and engineer to learn about the concepts inside those books. So the first one, obviously, algorithms that goes from explicit algorithm, decisional tree, or mathematical equations, systems, et cetera, et cetera, to machine learning, deep learning. And um, also the book on ethics. And I put that book because I'm actually currently reading it. It's behind in my library. The AI ethics book is interesting because I felt that today, more than ever, we need to work hard on developing um, AI models, algorithms that are ethics, ethical, that are responsible without any bias and discrimination, uh, because obviously um, we don't want to go back uh, in history. We want to move forward. We want to make sure that everybody has the same rights and, and the same chance you know, to, to succeed in any ways for medical application and other, other application like finance industry or, or at school, et cetera, um, et cetera. And that's it. I hope you, um, you understood a little bit what algorithm can do uh, to fight against COVID-19. And maybe you will learn more by uh, reading those books and, and understand how we actually build and practice those algorithms and how leaders can actually help you know, develop those algorithms to make them more efficient. Thank you, Aurelie. This is a rich uh, subject. We're getting lots of great questions, and we've got a few minutes where we can get to some of them. Um, first off, just going back to the beginning, your point about the al algorithms couldn't predict, that didn't predict, and perhaps couldn't predict this particular pandemic. Do you have hope that in future, however, having had this experience, that we might be able to make more effective use of algorithms to predict future pandemics? Yeah, that's a very good question, Peter. So first of all, uh, I hope we're not going to have another pandemic you know, <laughs> but if we have another pandemic in the future, yes, for two reasons. First, because if we have something that is similar to the COVID-19 virus, yes, because the everything that we, uh, that we aggregated, everything that we collected and everything that we have been developed uh, since a year ago, we are gonna be able to use it again, first of all. Second of all, even though the virus, even if the virus is not strictly like the COVID-19 virus, we actually um, learn how to develop faster, how to collect, which kind of data to collect on which, because here I didn't talk about that, but we collected specific data, but we also, I mean, when I say we, like scientists also collected different kind of data, not only medical data, but also social data, also transportation data, you know, all those data together then uh, by correlation can, uh, can um, you know, nourish the, 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 can train the algorithm. Great, thank you. And then moving on to uh, something you said, you talked about, how to uh, trust, as it were, uh, the uh, results or not that we're, that we're seeing, that we're getting from these, from these algorithms or the advice that we're getting. Why should we trust uh, algorithms versus human experts? So I love that question because I would say um, we should not trust any algorithm. What we have to do is to actually develop our critical sense towards those. So that's why I always say, even though you're not a scientist or an engineer, because you're going to use algorithm in your daily job or, your, or in your life, personal life. And also because you might at some point in your career make other people develop an algorithm for you, for your work, uh, for your market, for your disciplines, industry. You have to understand how it works because what the algorithm provides you, um, the algorithm provides you with a suggestion, you know, not an answer strict or sensory. You know what I mean? So in other words, you can actually reject the solution. You can actually modify 
um, the, the, the solution based on your own experience, which is unique to you. And, and so I would say trusting an algorithm is a weird way to express what I would say is more um, challenging the algorithm suggestion, you know, answer to make sure that the solution that you eventually retain is the best for the given problem you want to solve. So it sounds like you're you're saying or recommending that it's important to have humans in the in in the loop in the loop avoid yes. biases or at least be aware of them and also to address the ethical challenges at the same time are there ways that algorithms you you see can help us understand and and be more effective addressing the ethical challenges that they also create Yes, you know, yes, because I always say that even though we see more and more um, algorithm biases, you know, inside technologies or models that we've been using for our work or, or you know, personal life, well, actually, thanks to algorithms, we discovered we discovered that um, some discrimination that we thought disappeared are still there, because just don't forget that what you see in algorithms are actually what we are you know in other words the you know if you provide the algorithm with data to be trained on well if the data is is, is biased maybe because we are biased most of the time you know so it's interesting because yes algorithm can also can also help fight against those biases because they make us aware of those but also there are what i call algorithm watchers some algorithm that can actually track the evolution of a, another algorithm you know, to check whether by doing running tests and back testing when in production, to check whether the algorithm behaves differently or strongly, you know, significantly differently from one set of data to another, and maybe to understand why, and maybe there is a, a bias, you know, in the data on which it was, it was trained. So, yes, they can help us in many ways, technically and non technically. That's a really interesting point. So as the algorithms become more powerful and more complex, we need other algorithms to help us understand and yes. what they're doing. Uh, so maybe in the last couple of minutes, there was one question here I thought was wonderful, which is, uh, you know, as you look uh, back and a little bit forward into how algorithms have been and are being used in relation to COVID-19, uh, what's, if anything, has really surprised you? And, and what, if, if it's the same or a different thing, are you most excited about? Actually, yes. And you know what? It's interesting because the thing that I thought was the most exciting was the things that I'm not very comfortable with because I don't know about it, which is the vaccine uh, development. Because I knew that people were using simulations and algorithm to help them develop the vaccines in general, but I didn't know how powerful it was, you know. And so when I saw that we were so fast to develop this vaccine, those vaccines, because they were multiple, obviously not only one. And when I learned that it was um, the, acceleration, the acceleration was due to simulation, computer simulation, among others, obviously, you know. And I thought that was very impressive because it was a way to tell people, look, algorithm can help, you know. Algorithms are not only in social media to manipulate people, manipulate opinion or politics. No, it's, it's for many, many other things. And, and I like to say that because we tend to, uh, to see the glass all empty when talking about algorithm. And I think we should not, because if we do that, we don't see the opportunities and how we can use those in our life, in our work, in our project, in, with, the, with our team and our company. Thank you. Uh, thank you for spending uh, the last uh, this time with us. This has been a fascinating uh, subject, and there's so much more we could get into. But unfortunately, we're just a, at, just about out of time. So it remains for me, uh, Orly, to thank you uh, for sharing. Thank your you. With us, I can see from the questions in the chat that people have been really getting a lot out of this. We will follow up everyone uh, with a blog post that Orly will help us with to capture uh, responses to some of the questions that we weren't able to get to uh, today. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, as always, it, it's a pleasure. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing many of you, we hope, in future webinars. And once again, please join me in thanking Aurelie for spending this time with us. Thank you very much.